Has your friend ever started dating someone and they're like, you'll love him, he's so funny, and then you meet him and yeah, he is really funny, but then over the course of the night, he like messes up one joke. Like he says the punchline too early or just gets the joke totally wrong and you're thinking back on it and you're like, yeah, he's really funny, but you can't stop thinking about how he messed up this one joke. That's what we're talking about today. So originally I was just going to make a video about Back to the Future, but then Chris and I were listening to the Undertale soundtrack because we're weebs and it's good. And we realized that we had similar feelings about both things. We love Back to the Future and Undertale so much, so this is not a roast of either of them. I just want to discuss something that these two works have in common and how it could have been handled a little bit differently. In order to do this, we need to talk about the concept of setups and payoffs. It's actually kind of difficult to get a precise definition for the concept of setups and payoffs, but it's a very simple idea that can be difficult to execute. In simplest terms, a setup presents the audience with information, and a payoff is a return of that information as a form of storytelling. This article from ScreenCraft says it pretty well. The concept behind using setups and payoffs is to introduce a story point, visual, line of dialogue, character trait, or object early on within the script usually in subtle fashion, and to have that element return with the reveal that it is actually partial to the events to come later on in the story. If you're familiar with the idea of a Chekhov gun, it's the same idea. Renowned Russian playwright Anton Chekhov stated this, One must never place a loaded rifle on the stage if it isn't going to go off. It's wrong to make promises you don't mean to keep. Setups can be very large or very small. Here's a great example from a very popular movie. In Finding Nemo, Marlin and Nemo early on are talking about sea turtles and sharks. Have you ever met a shark? No, and I don't plan to. You know what? If I ever meet a sea turtle, I'll ask her. And over the course of his journey in the film, Marlin meets sea turtles and sharks. Another example. In Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones finds a snake in his lap and says, I hate snakes, shark! I hate them! This line would be meaningless if he didn't have to dangle over a snake pit later in the movie. So back to our first main feature here. Back to the Future is basically the king of setups and payoffs. If you Google setups and payoffs, the first results you get is from the Back to the Future wiki, and almost every article I looked at while writing this mentioned Back to the Future. Not just the first movie, but the entire trilogy. Here are just a few great examples of the setup and payoff concept in Back to the Future. Number one. Doc asks Marty to meet him at the Twin Pines Mall, which after returning to 1985 is called the Lone Pine Mall because Marty ran over one of the pine trees in 1955. Number two, the woman from the Hill Valley Preservation Society asks Marty and Jennifer for a donation for the clock tower that hasn't worked since it was struck by lightning. And then later in the movie, we actually see the clock tower get struck by lightning. Number three, in the opening sequence, the figurine of the drunk man in the clock foreshadows Red the Street Bum being the one who sees Marty return to 1985. Number four, in the original 1985, Biff says, I have your car towed all the way to your house and all you got for me is light beer. <laughs> but in the better 1985, when Doc is going through the trash can looking for fuel for the DeLorean, he pulls out a Miller High Life. This is another indicator of how wealthy the McFlys are in this timeline, because now they can afford a more expensive beer. And number five, in Back to the Future 2, Marty shows some kids how to play the Wild Gunman Arcade Cabinet, which is a shooting gallery game themed after the Old West. And then in three, Marty plays an actual shooting gallery in 1885. There are so many great examples of setups and payoffs in these movies. Especially in the first one, not a single moment goes to waste. Well, except for one. So Marty and his band audition for the school dance. They play the song, The Power of Love by Huey Lewis in the News. The school administrator stops them and says, I'm afraid you're just too darn loud. Well, in 1955, Marty does end up getting to play for the school dance, just not the one he was aiming for. He famously plays Chuck Berry's Johnny B. Good, and while at first the kids at the dance really do like it, his Van Halen solo goes a bit over their heads. These two scenes seem like they're going to be great parallels of each other, a great chance for a setup and a payoff, but they aren't. They're so close. So let's talk about this failed setup. Huey Lewis and the News wrote and performed two songs for Back to the Future. One, Back in Time, is played on the radio and then used during the end credits, and the other, The Power of Love, is in the intro after Marty is introduced as a character. It is a non-diegetic piece of music, meaning that it doesn't exist in the world of the story, and the audience hears it, but the characters don't. Except, wait, it is diegetic. Marty and his band play it for the audition mere minutes after we heard it the first time. While the power of love is no doubt a banger, lyrically it doesn't really fit in with the theme of the movie at all, 
And that's okay. Historically, this is because Huey Lewis didn't want to write a song called Back to the Future and didn't really want to do the film at all until Robert Zemeckis told him that he could write a song about whatever he wanted. This interview with Lewis from USA Today has a lot of really interesting information about how the power of love came to be, including implying that Huey Lewis and the News is Marty's favorite band. Even though I'm pretty sure that Van Halen is Marty's favorite band, but that's a different conversation, whatever. And as an inside joke between Robert Zemeckis and Huey Lewis, Huey Lewis actually is the school administrator that says, I'm sorry boys, you're just too darn loud. There he is, that's him, right there. So all of these points lead to a really interesting series of questions. First of all, if Huey Lewis is the school administrator, does Huey Lewis and the News exist at all in this universe? Well, it must, because Marty has a poster for the album Sports, and Back in Time plays on the radio. But the song The Power of Love wasn't released until after this movie came out, so how does Marty know this song at all? Is the movie trying to imply that Marty wrote The Power of Love? These questions aren't really relevant to the plot of Back to the Future at all, so I guess they don't really matter. But we still have the setup. Marty's band auditions to play for the school dance with the song The Power of Love. So let's talk about the failed payoff. So Marty finally gets to play for the school dance after Marvin, the lead guitar player, cuts his hand. After playing Earth Angel and getting George to kiss Lorraine, Marty decides to lead Johnny Be Good. As we all know, Marvin Berry calls his cousin Chuck Berry and says this. Chuck, it's Marvin, your cousin Marvin Berry. You know that new sound you're looking for? Well, listen to this. This implies that Chuck Berry didn't actually write Johnny Be Good. One little bootstrap Doctor Who paradox isn't going to tank the entire movie's plot, but it's a fun Easter egg, so whatever. Except Johnny Be Good comes out of nowhere. We, the audience, have no prior knowledge that Marty knows this song well enough to perform it as well as he does, especially when he hasn't shown any interest in early rock and roll at any point in the movie. We know that he likes Van Halen, and we know he likes Huey Lewis in the news. And I have questions about this, just like I do Power of Love. Why does he decide to play this song? Maybe he sees Marvin Berry's name on the drum head and thinks, oh, Marvin Berry, like Chuck Berry. But I feel like Marty has other things to worry about in 1955 besides looking at custom drum heads. Also, he says blues riff in B, but it's actually in B flat, and I don't need to keep beating this dead horse. We've been beating this horse for 35 years. I don't shot that horse! Anyway, it's a fun moment, but story-wise, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But we'll come back to this. All right, all right. Let's talk about the thing that the other half of you clicked on this video for. So we've established setups and payoffs. Do they appear in Undertale? Oh yes, yes they do. First off, in the ruins, which serves as the game's tutorial slash intro level to the game's mechanics, primarily the mercy mechanic. This frogget explains to you that if a monster's text is yellow, it's ready to be spared. Froggett then continues by saying that one day, you may have to spare someone even if their text isn't yellow. This is a setup for most of the game, but primarily the upcoming battle with Toriel. The payoff is that you have to do exactly this in order for the game to progress along the pacifist route. A visual setup is the crest on Toriel's dress, the Delta Rune. At the beginning of the game, you don't really know anything about her or who she is. But the crest appears again and again. It appears on the door leading out of the ruins, it appears on lesser dog shields, and it appears in the stained glass windows of Asgore's palace. The crest is a symbol for the kingdom of monsters. The setup is the crest appearing on her shirt. The payoff is that at the end we learn that Toriel is the queen of the underground. But Undertale's setups and payoffs are most evident in its music. Here's a setup. When the player dies in-game, the song Determination plays. This isn't heard anywhere else in the game until the payoff. When you get to Asgore, Determination is one of the main motifs in his song. This reveals that when you've died, it's been Asgore talking to the fallen child the whole time. One of the other motifs in his song is the same as Heartache, which is the same music that plays when you fight Toriel. The setup is that this is Toriel's music, and the payoff is that it is also Asgore's. The two have more in common than you might initially realize. Here's another setup. The music for Ghost Fight and the music for the Dummy Fight are exactly the same. Is this a mistake? Of course not. The setup is that this is the music for ghosts, whether you know it or not. The payoff is that the Mad Dummy is also a ghost. There are so many hidden gems in the Undertale soundtrack, just little things that Toby Fox has hidden for us. How characters are related, how places are related, how themes change and progress can all be heard across the game's music. So what's my beef? Well, let's talk about Papyrus. Firstly, Nyehehe is the tune that plays when he is first introduced. This theme is further developed in Bone Trousel, the battle music for Papyrus. And cool, that's all well and good. So as some of you might know, Papyrus has a brother, and you only fight said brother in the genocide route of Undertale. 
And that battle music is a pretty catchy tune, and it's almost become more popular than Undertale itself. You could write a master's thesis about this song. As some of you might know, Megalovania existed before Undertale did. Toby Fox originally wrote it for an Earthbound ROM hack. It was later used in the webcomic Homestuck, and it was such a catchy tune that it was used in multiple parts of Homestuck. Only one other song from Undertale also appears in Homestuck, sort of. This is Another Medium, which went through three different iterations. The first, Doctor, sounds basically nothing like the finished version in Undertale. The second is an unfinished remix Toby Fox did called Patience, which I can't find anywhere on the internet because the site that hosted it no longer exists. The third iteration is Another Medium, as it appears, finished on the Undertale soundtrack. This is hardly comparable to Megalovania's evolution. Only three other songs were written for other projects before appearing in Undertale. They are <laughs> Bone Trousel, and Heartache. These were all written for another RPG project, which became Delta Rune, which is sort of a sequel to Undertale. Of the songs from Undertale that predate the game, Megalovania is by far the most popular. It already existed on the internet in its mostly final form, and people already owned the song if they owned the soundtrack to Volume 6 of Homestuck. Toby Fox knew that this song was catchy, and he knew that it was already kind of popular. So, he chose to use it for the music when you fight Sans. Except, the theme or motif from Megalovania doesn't appear anywhere else on the soundtrack. Not even, like, as a reference. And that's not terrible, but here's the thing. There's a song on the soundtrack that doesn't appear anywhere in the game called Song That Might Play When You Fight Sans. It's a faster version of the song Sans, and it even tags Bone Trousel because, you know, Skeleton Brothers. So why didn't Toby Fox use this song for the Sans fight? So here's my hottest take. Megalovania, the most popular song on the Undertale soundtrack, doesn't belong on the Undertale soundtrack. <laughs> Without going into this whole idea of Sans isn't from this universe, he's from another timeline, so Megalovania reflects that, there's more to Sans than meets the eye, while Papyrus isn't, whatever. It's thematically confusing that Megalovania gets used instead of song that might play when you fight Sans. So what does this have to do with Back to the Future? <laughs> Back to the Future and Undertale. Both of these pieces of media are perfect except for one moment where a choice was made to go with something that would be a guaranteed hit rather than thematically consistent. Back to the Future uses the power of love for Marty's audition instead of Johnny B. Good, and Undertale uses Megalovania for the Sans fight instead of Song That Might Play When You Fight Sans. Both Megalovania and The Power of Love are no doubt banger songs, but were guaranteed hits outside of the work they appear in. Huey Lewis and the News was slash is a very popular band, and Megalovania had already appeared multiple times in the most popular webcomic of all time. The only difference being The Power of Love was written for Back to the Future. So with all this in mind, how do we fix these failed setups and payoffs? Undertale is an easy fix. Just play the song, song that might play when you fight Sans, when you fight Sans. Back to the Future, however, is going to be a bit more detailed of a fix. So we have two incohesive parts, a setup for the power of love that doesn't go anywhere, and a payoff for Johnny B. Good that doesn't come from anywhere. Knowing that Marty plays guitar isn't a good enough setup for a movie that is so meticulously crafted. So we need to find a way to unify these two scenes to make a perfect setup and payoff experience. I have two solutions. One is kind of easy, and the other one is a little more complex. Solution number one. So let's say Zemeckis has already paid Huey Lewis to write the song for the movie, and he's already in costume and ready for his cameo. Sure. We can leave the power of love in place for Marty's audition, and while it doesn't answer any of my previous questions about how Marty knows the song, it doesn't fundamentally change anything about the movie. But we still need to get Johnny B. Good into the setup, so how do we do it? It's very easy. Once Marty has run on stage for his audition, all he needs to do is play the opening riff of Johnny B. Good as a little warm-up. It's a fairly impressive lick, and it would establish that the character knows this song. Even if you don't know the song Johnny Be Good, 
which I don't know how anybody in the USA at least could exist this long and never hear the song Johnny Be Good. The opening riff is very recognizable and you'd be able to tell that it's the same song that he plays later at the dance. So it's just his warm up and then the band plays The Power of Love anyway. Easy peasy, we get to keep Huey Lewis and we establish that Marty knows Johnny Be Good. But that's not nearly satisfying enough, is it? Solution number two. You know, now that I think of it, Huey Lewis can keep his cameo, it doesn't matter. In this solution, Marty's band just doesn't play Power of Love. We can keep the Power of Love as a non-diegetic song in the intro, and that's just fine. Instead, Marty comes up on stage and his band plays Johnny Be Good for their audition. Huey Lewis's character, the school administrator, still stops them. Except this time, he says, I'm sorry, fellas, the song's too old. You need to play something more relevant that the kids are gonna love. So now when Marty goes back to 1955, he realizes, Hey, Johnny Be Good is actually current right now. So he plays it, and the kids love it until he spices it up with his Van Halen solo. Because now the song is too new. See, poor Marty doesn't belong in any time period. Ha ha ha, what a great movie. But your kids are gonna love it. Isn't that just way more satisfying? A setup and payoff for Johnny Be Good. Anyway, like I said, I love Back to the Future and I love Undertale. Both are tightly written and well-crafted. Back to the Future is well shot and well acted. Undertale, made almost entirely by one person, is a heartbreaking and hilarious story that changed the gaming industry. Back to the Future is the king of setups and payoffs. And there's a reason we're still talking about this movie 35 years later. And I have no doubt that Undertale will be a vintage classic in 30 years. But both Toby Fox and Robert Zemeckis chose to go with songs at pivotal plot points that were thematically weak, but guaranteed to be popular. And these franchises clearly don't need my help. Like, they have done very well without my input. But we have to think critically about the things we enjoy. It helps us grow. And while these aren't huge criticisms, I just wanted to point out how close to perfect these two pieces of media are, in my opinion. It's really interesting that they both share the same flaw. I mean, besides creating scenarios where some of the audience ships the main character with their maternal figure, you know. Hey guys, sorry I forgot to film this and now I sound like crap because I am recovering from my second COVID shot, but special thank you to my patrons on Patreon, uh, Josh Ferguson, Alexis Womack, I am the Teacup, and Brian Barnes. Check me out on Patreon if you'd like to support what I do. Thank you guys so much. Is the movie trying to imply that Marty wrote The Power of Love? Huey. Huey. It's Marvin! Your cousin, Marvin! Lewis. You know that new sound you're looking for? Well, listen to this! Yeah.